welcome to the umpteenth Skeptics in the Hub. I honestly can't remember how many I've done now, so I've got to call it the umpteenth. Tonight, we have a fantastic subject and an equally fantastic guest. As some of you know, I get involved in quite a lot of the debates, arguments even, with believers of various faiths. And it seems to me to be odd that they accuse us of believing that we originated, that we came from rock. Yet their belief is that Adam was made from dust. I'm not sure what the difference is there. But of course, saying that we came from rock leaves out a huge progression of what actually may have happened. Tonight, we have the man who is working at the cutting edge on this, Professor Lee Cronin from Glasgow University. Hello, Lee. Good evening, John. How's it going? It's fine here. How's, how the devil are you? Fine. Uh, the rain stopped up here. It's been <laughs> raining very deadly the last couple of days. Yes, we're lucky. We uh, watch the weather forecast and we see all the blue up north and we think, aren't we lucky to be down in the south coast? <laughs> it's a shame, though, isn't it? Because the cricket match started today and then the last session was rained off. Okay, yeah, that's a pity. You're not into, you're not into cricket. <laughs> um, I used to be once upon a time when I was when I was a lecturer in Birmingham, and I wasn't that far from East Boston. So, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. Anyway, um, is it biogenesis or a biogenesis? I get mixed up because one of them is what Pasteur did when he found that you have to keep life out to stop food decaying. Wasn't that biogenesis? Sure, then, I guess so. And then uh, abiogenesis is this idea that we may have come, from, organics may have come from inorganics. Is that? Yeah, I mean, it, it must be the case. I mean, there, there, it's that abiogenesis happened at some point in the past. Um, the argument is under the conditions that it did happen and what that means. But, but I, I think it's indisputable that we are all inorganic back at the beginning of the earth. Yes. Well, it's, isn't it a false dichotomy between organic and inorganic? Uh, when, when it started, uh, first of all, chemistry came out of alchemy and then it was all inorganic until somebody realized that living organisms were made of elements too. And so at I that point, they decided to have a branch called organic chemistry for the chemistry of uh, living compounds, as it were. But there's no real distinction, is there? Because uh, organic, so-called, is just carbon's chemistry. Yeah, there is. you're absolutely right. There is no distinction between organic and inorganic chemistry per se. Um, I think that the historians of science would argue that we have invented the divide in, in the current time, and actually there was never really much of a divide there was a little bit of a divide where people thought that there were molecules that only organic um, living systems could make, and there was something vital about those molecules. Now, I think one of the things I might tell you tonight is that, indeed, there are some molecules that only life can make, but that's because of the amount of information and the amount of selective information that we have from evolution. But actually, the molecule that you can make in the laboratory and the molecule that occurs on the meteorites and the molecule that might have occurred at the, you know, at the, when the Earth has formed, there is nothing different about them. But life is capable of complexity that that basically abiogenic, inorganic chemistry on its own is not. Right. And why are they all right-handed? Just a decision that gets made um, arbitrarily. But where there's an argument, I guess it's a bit like you know, some of your uh, uh, attendees they may remember videotapes. And why there was VHS and Betamax. Well, why did VHS beat Betamax? Well, one simple reason is that Sony issued uh, Betamax and banned pornography from being um, distributed on Betamax, which was one of the reasons why VHS took off. It was an arbitrary reason. Yes, yes. For complexity, you needed you need some particular way of twisting molecules, and there's two options, a left hand and a right hand, and there was mm. an arbitrary decision made at some point just in the same way that on, in the UK we drive on the left-hand side and in the US mm. we drive on the right-hand side. There's, mm. there's, there's lots of causal structures for that, but, but none of them is, you know, 
hardwired into the universe. Yes, yes. So somewhere there might be a whole diversity of life that's left-handed, chirality. Yeah, pro probably not on Earth, but probably elsewhere. And the reason why mm. I don't think it's possible on Earth because life probably had to emerge on Earth as a planetary phenomena. And the, mm. so there would be this kind of um, uh, decision that was made because the infrastructure required for the production of, um, uh, of uh, proteins and all the machinery in the cell had to be one. Ha that decision had to be made early, basically. Yes, yes, yes. I see. So while we're on the subject of false dichotomies, is there really a division between chemistry and biology? Um, no, I would say not. I would say that merely the difference between chemistry and biology is biology is chemistry with a history and with a memory and it's self-contained. And other than that, everything's exactly the same. And of course, biology, the chemistry of biology is more restricted than uh, the chemistry of chemistry. So in some, some respects, biology is simpler than chemistry. Right. <laughs> we used to have discussions about this. <clears throat> when I was a, a school teacher a long time ago, it was the physics department that claimed that they were the best science because everything boils down to physics. And I used to claim that biology was the best science because it's the most complicated, it's the top of the tree. Well, I mean, I don't know what you mean to say is best, but I think you're absolutely right that biology by virtue of um, evolution is much more complex than physics. Physics has a lot of universal laws, but those universal laws come out of simplicity in the cosmos in terms of the way that the fundamental processes are conducted. So I would say that physics is the dumbest science because you need the least amount of information to um, explain universal phenomena like gravity and the formation of galaxies and, and suns and things like that and stars. Well, that's what I was trying to say, but I didn't want to call my, my <laughs> fellow teachers dumb. Well, no, I mean, I remember I talked to, about the, the, the subject being the dumbest, not the people who practice it. It just it means I could probably derive all the physics on the back of a, if I was bright enough, on the back of an envelope just given a few basic <laughs> axioms, yeah. whereas yeah. I don't think I could derive all the biology on the back of an envelope. No, no. Not even an A4 envelope, no. <laughs> <laughs> so on, on this subject, when we're talking about false dichotomies, isn't more or less everything uh, some sort of continuous progression? Have we found any real dichotomies, do you think? Well, in terms of barriers between, well, I mean, I can, I suppose we can point to a system that's dead and not alive and say, this is dead, you know, to go out in the backyard and take a rock and say, this rock has been, you know, several billion years old. You can probably uh, use radio dating um, or some kind of isotopic mapping. Um, and then you could take, I don't know, uh, a, a living thing, uh, a hedgehog, a mouse, whatever, and say, well, that clearly is is able to move around and shows an agency, it has intent, it does stuff, it eats stuff. So I would say that there is, if you take those two extremes, there's clearly a difference between them. Now the stuff in them, there's salt in the hedgehog and the mouse and the human, and there's mm -hmm. salt on the, on the, you know, on the, on, the, on the earth. What is the difference between that salt on the mouse and, uh, and the living thing and the salt on, salt on the earth? Well, there's absolutely no difference. It's the same stuff, but it's mm -hmm. how the stuff is organized. And so I think that there is no real um, discrete barrier between the things that are highly organized and disorganized. I think one of the big, for me, the big starting way of answering a, what I think is a very big question, which is how did life start on Earth? And is life present elsewhere in the universe, which I think is even more interesting, uh, it is to do with how matter is able to be organized over time and how that matter is literally able to start an arms race with itself to just persist. Yes, so yes. a rock can persist by doing nothing. That's really boring. But a collection of very fragile molecules can persist by copying themselves continually and um, seeing how the environment treats it and then coming up with strategies randomly, if you like, but with a 
forward selection, and we can talk about what that means later, to then be propagated into the future. Yeah. Well, you mentioned um, life on other planets, and of course that's topical at the moment because we just launched a mission to Mars to uh, examine the prospect of life actually being there. You, you also mentioned intentionality, and this is something that uh, the people I argue with find difficult. They, they say that even if a brain is made of you know, the same sort of chemicals that it is in fact made of, chemicals cannot show intentionality. So they, they say that the consciousness must have been imposed from above by God and the mind and the brain are separate. Yeah, well, that's, that's um, I mean, I, I think that that's, uh, I have sympathy with the mystery associated with that view because we all wake up every day and we, we all kind of experience a phenomena that we can kind of think that other people have, this, this idea of consciousness. But consciousness probably in, in that definition really doesn't exist. And, and I think that it's not, a, it's not, I'm not kind of saying that you don't have a right to exist or think or have opinions. But those, there, there is no kind of mind matter barrier. You know, it is just matter. And the more yes. research we do, and the more questions we ask, the more we find there is no evidence that there is anything other than matter and the organisation of that matter. Indeed, yes. we can we can fool um, 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 brains into thinking all sorts of things by playing around with a neurological system or adding mm -hmm. chemicals to the neurons and things like that. So you know. I'm sympathetic, but um, the, the the current data and paradigm has shifted way beyond. You know, I'd love to think that there is some kind of mysterious, you know, ethereal universe which I'm tethered to. But no, just yes. in here, here, crush my head. I no longer exist. I'm afraid. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's so true. But they, it doesn't stop them arguing that for a supernatural realm, and I, I tend to prefer the word unnatural realm. Just to annoy them. Yeah, I mean, I think so those arguments are, are really interesting to have. Um, but I think that the issue that we've got is when we're talking about science and belief, I don't think those arguments are actually against one another. Um, I've long said that really, you know, sci I'm a scientist. I love to ask questions. I love to be wrong. In fact, that's why I'm a good scientist is I'm really good at being wrong. And it's recognizing when you're wrong. And because you do experiments, you, 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 you use a scientific method. When that same type, that scientific method can no longer be applied, you are entitled to have a supernatural yes. belief, if you like. But yeah. what science does is this. Is science kind of like, if you say that supernatural here and, and, and natural is here, all science is doing is pushing up, and, and it, this is happening. And yes, I, yes. It, you know, at no point in our history of science have we... Um, has, you know, the supernatural leaped back and said, ah, I've caught you out. I mean... We have telepathy now. Well, we have mobile phones. Uh, you, have, you, know, you have iPods in. I can put an iPod in my ear. I can connect it to my phone with Bluetooth. Completely natural explanation. that someone else across the world could do the same thing. Are we using, te uh, is it telepathy? Well, it looks the same, but we're using technology, radio waves, satellites, and uh, electronics to communicate. Yes. yes. If it's, if it's uh, advanced enough, it's going to look like magic, isn't it? Like somebody famous said that. Um, Independent magisteria, then. Should we put uh, science in one box and supernatural, the belief systems, in another? Who was it? Is that Stephen Jay Gould? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of have a, some sympathy for that, but I think they, they're related to one another. I don't think it's right for me as a scientist who happens to be a fairly de like determined atheist. I mean, I'm a very determined individual, but I don't see the need to invoke a supernatural but what i don't think is by just saying you know taking the stephen j Gould, or maybe even more recently the richard dawkins approach where we just say well actually you know religious people are somehow um uh, not smart enough to understand science i think that what we have to be very in very uh, very clear on is that everyone or like for me everyone's entitled to a religious belief but when i argue with someone who comes from a religious point you go to say well look what is falsifiable and what do you believe? And just keep, they're touching like this, right? And so that's the idea is that science and religion do this. And actually them talking together is useful. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily good to have a superior notion. Because even Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, who was a former guest on your, on your, yeah. on your show, 
um, uh, have beliefs. We all have beliefs. And mm. it's not that I'm suddenly saying, admitting I'm uh, religious. It's just there are certain things I can't necessarily falsify, but I have a strong feeling that they exist. Yes. Mm. And I, that's, that's what the belief system is, isn't it? Mm. Well, I, I like to use the analogy that you're at the horse race and before it starts, you can believe one of the horses will win. You can believe that right up until the end of the race when you be it becomes known which horse did win. And at that point, believing is redundant. There's no point exercising active belief in the winner because the evidence is too solid to require you to wish to accept it. Sure. I mean, that, that could be one way of doing it. I think there's many ways to have these discussions and have them productively. And I think what I kind of want to like to do is when I take part in these debates and some of my colleagues advise me against it, and I'm like, well, as long as I don't get – what I don't like to do is give fuel to people who want to use the debate in a, in a, in a non um, – I suppose, um, in a, in a, in a, in a non-sociable way in, or a, an unproductive yeah. way to basically say, ah, yeah. oh, Cronin said this thing, I said this thing, therefore yeah. I, this is wrong, <laughs> therefore science is all wrong. I'm, I'm going to yeah. make mistakes in any debate. That doesn't mean that, that, there is a, that there is a there is God. That doesn't mean if I'm correct in the debate that there definitely isn't a God. All I can yeah. tell you is that through the scientific research I've been doing, I can, I can tell you these things I know about the universe and these things I don't know. I don't know how the universe started. I don't think it's really possible to know how it started right now. That's an interesting question. We don't know how it ends. We don't know if there's life elsewhere. So there's lots of interesting questions that we don't know the answer to. Yes. So another expression, I loved your expression. Uh, what was it? Belief, where falsifiability ends, belief begins. That's uh, that rings. That that's a reverberating phrase to me, and my version of it is, a belief is an opinion about the unknown. Whoa! A belief is an opinion. I suppose in the in the non, um, if, if you don't, if you're able to just basically say that we're if we're all able to normalize our baggage, if you like. Because our belief in the unknowns are, are going to be shaped by our psychological profile, our experience in the world, and how we think the world looks, right? Mm, so, yes. you know, some chemists believe that the origin of life was started with a molecule called RNA. And mm. RNA is actually the information vector inside the COVID 19. And that this RNA, which is needed in your cells to build the machinery, the proteins, Yes. Uh, it allows your cells to work. So then these mm. there's a lot of chemists out there trying to make RNA in their laboratory because they believe that the RNA world was the start of um, the origin of life. Where I would argue that it's the RNA is a bit like saying there was there's a all of Shakespeare's plays just suddenly assembled and then constructed the author. So I think although they've got the right idea, it's kind of a, it's a kind of dogma that's in the wrong, going in the wrong direction. So there's lots of you know lots of even scientists have beliefs, right? That they do try and falsify, and then mm. once they manage to falsify them, then well, hey, yes. they're no longer beliefs; they're in the realm of uh, okay, we 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 know a little bit more. Yes, yes, it's we we would call them hypotheses rather than beliefs, maybe, <clears throat> yeah. or perhaps that, that's, that's a little bit further down the road because. We have to have based it on what is known and come up with some way in which it could be investigated to be a hypothesis. But somebody on, in our audience has come up with this very idea. Look, is a virus alive? Uh, that's a really good question. I can give you, I, I can give you the answer that, that the virus is as alive as you are, right? In that none of us are really alive, uh, uh, actually. <laughs> Life is a process where you must be able to replicate. So it, if you have replicated in the past and you have kids, then you were alive once because you have propagated yourself. And, yes. I, and this is a difference between living and alive. And this may seem weird, right? It's like, what is Lee saying? It's like, 
So yeah, viruses, folks, uh, folks, I told you he was a radical thinker. <laughs> so viruses are, are not alive or dead, and some way you're not alive or dead, but viruses are a product of life, and in fact, they are evidence of evolution. So I would prefer to say is that, that a virus inside a cell is alive because it's reproducing. A virus outside a cell is not alive, but it has the potential to be alive in a cell. So I think that the question is a really good one because it's a classic trap that we fall yes. into about the def definition of life. So yes. I, a friend of mine is an astronaut, <laughs> astronaut friend of mine who um, was arguing about life and said, well, look, you know, when you're in space, and this guy was the last guy to touch the Hubble Space Telescope, right? He fixed it uh, yeah, and then yeah. we did several missions. And yeah. so I said, well, look, if, you were, if we left you in space, you would not be alive for very long. You would be dead because obviously you'd run out of oxygen and food and all of this. And also your capable, your potential to have more children would be gone. Mm -hmm. uh, so we start to have this debate about what it, it, it's like, is anything, if it, is anything off Earth alive? Because we're all bound to Earth, and without Earth, we can't live. Mm. So that's a really interesting thing. So probably you're as alive as the virus is. Was the virus produced by evolution? Yes. Were you produced by evolution? Yes. Were my glasses the product of evolution? Yes. My glasses... I suppose uh, on their own aren't, can't replicate, but they may help, actually help me see potential, you know, <laughs> if I was a youngster looking for a, a mate to make more children, I suppose. So I think that but the crucial question is not if something is alive or not, has it been produced by the process of evolution? And I would like to replace those questions. But anyway, the answer to the question is a virus is alive in a cell, the virus outside the cell has a potential to be alive or functionally dead. Yeah, it's, it's effectively a crystal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so a virus is really like this, this memory chip. It doesn't do anything until you plug it in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so you, the thinking you, you've got there is a bit sort of selfish gene-like, isn't it? And this, this is another problem that the people I discuss with who don't know anything about biology much, they, they don't realize that evolution happens on populations not individuals and so so the actual moment of living as you put it is during reproduction or replication yeah the notion of selfish gene is a brilliant book I've got it up there somewhere i think it's mm. i think it's like everything very simplified i think what biology tends to do is create layers layers of complexity that allow adaptation and selection and almost like now, you know, we've got this really interesting thing, say, in social media. I mean, I, I'm certainly too old to have used a dating app, right? But I'm sure most young people now, from what I gather, use dating apps to communicate yeah. and find partners. So, so there's kind of like this extra layer of technology required with biology to kind of advance the species. Um, and I think that what we have to understand is that genes themselves can't be selfish. It's almost like the gene inside the cell gives the cell to capability that it wouldn't otherwise have if that gene has been selected in a population over time. And I think that, you know, it takes real egotists, if you like. I don't mean this is a, a, a punch. At, um, a, a, I'm not demurring against Richard Dawkins because he's a fantastic individual, great writer, and has some great insights. But I think that the selfish gene was a great way to sell a book but it's a really well, poor way to understand how biology works. Yes, you may not know that when the book was reissued, Dawkins wrote a foreword to his own book in which he explained that he was against the title, but it was his publisher's idea to make a marketing prospect. I think it's a really, I think it's a really good title from that point of view because what you want to title the book to do is to provoke you into thinking but it shouldn't replace the body of knowledge that people then take the title as the mm. explanation. It really should, mm. the title should be raise curiosity to say, okay, critically thinking, what is a gene? What is selfishness? What is life? And why does life even exist? You know, why am I so confident there is alien life in the universe? Right. And probably intelligent life as well. And, and, and that's really exciting. Once we understand how, not how easy life is, but the emergence of life in the universe is probably as 
um, likely as the emergence of fusion, nuclear fusion in a star. It's right. a process. When yes, you get yes. hydrogen together under gravity, at some point there's an ignition and you have a mm. shiny light. Mm. Yeah. So selfish gene was a sort of paperback version of clickbait before the term had been yeah, invented. Exactly. I agree. I yeah. agree. Mm. So you, you've uh, got some videos for us, haven't you? Yeah. Sh shall I screen the first one of those? Sure. We can probably get the second one, actually, not the title one, because the cube is in the background. Oh, so you want me to do the second one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Coming up. Yeah, so one of the things, I'm a chemist in my lab, so we've got basically four things we're trying to do. We're trying to make an artificial life form, that is to make something completely different to the life you find on Earth today. And when we were doing that, we realized we can make robots to make drugs to digitize chemistry. And when we realized we can make robots to make drugs, we realized we could use the idea of making drugs to think and make a kind of chemical consciousness. And that all brought us back to the final question, which is, it, does chemistry allow the universe to invent information through evolution and by making biology? So how does random chemistry become a genetic system? And that is the question that drives everything on this slide. And that's what my lab is trying to do in Glasgow, which is make artificial life forms in the lab, make robots to do chemistry, make computers out of chemistry to understand consciousness, but really to understand this thing that what is information in the universe and how did it actually emerge in the first place? And there's a very nice little, that, that video in that there with all those squares kind of changing color is actually a chemical computer um, calculating a uh, solution to a problem in real time using chemistry in a, that, in a little box. So all those lights changing are actually chemical reactions in a grid and they're all talking to each other. So that's your random number generator, which is better than the uh, pseudo random number generators that the computer boffins have come up with? So that's one application of it. Yeah, that's one manifestation. And what it is, is literally that box there is a series of chemical, chemical clocks, which are all each tick tocking, and you can synchronize them together. When you synchronize them, or they get synchronized by you programming them, they can then process information. And because they're all tick tocking together um, in the chemistry, you can do calculations and, and instantiate um, logical problems in a slightly different way to you would in a digital computer. And that's what you've actually got happening behind you there? So now in there, this is an LED cube, which I actually bought my son for Christmas, but he didn't want to, he doesn't like it. And in there, it's just basically 512 LEDs. And in the bottom of that cube, there's a little um, computer. And this is playing a digital version of the game I showed you in oh. chemistry. And this is called right. Conway's Game of Life. And so it's a very simple game where a single cell is either alive or dead. And the cells that propagate around are living. And actually this model here, you can see all those lights on, is exactly the same as the propagation of a virus. So if you wanted to model how COVID-19 would move from cell to cell, from neighborhood to neighborhood, if you look at how that's fizzling out and going around and then stopping, that type of model would explain how the virus is propagating around the world right now. We're kind of in the middle of that before it vanishes. It will vanish. Well, not vanish forever, but you know, it will get down yeah. to the point where we, we, it's no longer uh, um, kind of exciting. Right. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. So will we one day have chemical computers for the lottery? We have them right now in here. So when I, oh, ask, I, see. You, when I, when I ask you to think of your numbers for the lottery or think of anything, I mean, yes. when people say, oh, you're crazy, you can't make a chemical computer. And I'm saying, OK, um, solve a quadratic equation. Or if you don't do that, just tell me what 12 times 12 is. Or, you know, some numerical, and you think about it, right? You know, well, you, your brain is made of chemicals. There's nothing else yeah. going on like salt and a bit of gel. Um, and it's in here. And yes, so, yeah. um, <laughs> so, so when people say, oh, you know, it's crazy, you can't make a chemical computer, I just say, well, OK, you know. I don't have any original ideas. I just steal them from nature, right? So, but I, will I make a chemical computer that could solve the lottery, that, that could maybe play the lottery? Sure. Um, 
It'd probably be a lot, lot less interesting than a human being doing it, though. Yes, yes. Except that human beings are very bad at picking lottery numbers because they look at they they look at the gaps and they think we need to have them spaced out as if that's going to make a difference to a random generation. Well, at the end of the day, there is no strategy to playing the lottery because it is no. random. However, yeah. if you're playing poker, or if maybe even you're doing, maybe playing roulette, if you're paying attention, and you're not being too biased by the, the, your, 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 the way that the brain thinks, you might be able to get a strategy that will allow you to win. Um, but I think there is no strategy to, to win the lottery. I don't play the lottery. Um, I'm, I'm sure if I, ha I mean, once upon a time, um, when my father turned 70 a few years ago, we, we were going to place a bet on the Grand National. And and, he, and I was there with my two sons, and I just said, I don't bet, it's ridiculous. He said, no, you don't understand. I'm giving you money to put on the Grand, Grand National. I said, well, how much? He said, 50 pounds. I said, okay, 50 pounds. And do I keep the winnings? You keep the winnings. So I said, got my two sons together. I said, look, we're going to look at the winners. We're going to look, sorry, look at the horses. We're going to look up their form. I'm going, to use a, we're going to, I'm going to use a bit of probability, a Bayesian probability, and I'm going to take the long, something that I'm, there's too many horses, right? So I took, yes. and I don't not care, I don't care about winning a hundred pounds. It was like, I want to win big or nothing at all. Uh -huh. Right, so long odds. We just took the horses, did a bit of Bayesian math. We looked at the long form, picked the best of the long form, put the 50 yeah. pounds on that. And then during the, during the, uh, uh, my youngest son, Aiden was like watching the horse race with me. And my father's horse was second, putting up first. And mine was, I think it was Wings of Eagle. <laughs> and what happened was it was last. But in the last 100 metres, a gap opened up and Wings of Eagle went boom. And I went, won 450 pounds. Wow. Um, so it wasn't that long odds, but it was long enough to make a sufficient yeah. amount of money. But I thought that was an illustration of using a little bit of Bayesian probability, yeah, getting yeah. information on the form and taking a guess. Yeah. And yeah. You can't do that with a lottery. But you can do it a little bit. Wow, well, horse racing probably not either. I probably just got lucky. But you were lucky, story, yeah. right? If you, if you believed in luck, you were lucky. Yes, I, I did it rationally, but it was yes. in a rational yes. act. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I like to think of the lottery as voluntary taxation for the statistically ignorant. Yeah, I mean, that, or there are some people in there that, that realise they're going to lose money and they just do it because they like hope. They, and they think it's fun. Yeah. And so, and so you know, a pound, a pound of taking a punt here or there and it's exciting to have a look and, you know, one day you might win. Yeah. There, there's yeah. a chance. Mm. So shall I play your next sure. video? I like this one. So this is, this video basically shows um, how you can erase information and therefore forget what something looked like. So on the side that you've got a, uh, a, a, a an artist clearly made road in and you've got some DNA. So my question is, how much of the features do you have to erase over time before you can not recognize it was the product of biology? And so this was kind of a play on um, when I go out and I look for aliens, if I can't find a living alien, but I can find, say, a virus, which isn't, you know, or a, or maybe something very complicated, at which point can I determine within on a scale of probability that object was produced by the process of selection in a biological system rather than than a random physical processes in the in the environment and that was kind of a video i made to demonstrate to a rich benefactor who wanted to invest in a space mission to go looking for life and i needed to explain to them that we were then looking for complex molecules like dna and they should compare it like artwork and it's like you know if i if i find a load of you know i don't know um jackson pollocks if you find one jackson pollock somewhere you'll be like that's just a random painting. It looks a bit crazy. Maybe it's interesting. But behind a whole load of them, you're like, well, there's structure here, and they look like they've been created by the same individual, or at least someone in that same style. So how many mm. Jackson Pollocks do you need to find before you conclude that wasn't a random paint mess mm. made by a five-year-old, but it was actually a competent artist um, doing something? And that's really, really interesting question. And we've made an alien detector based on that.
Wow. So what's it looking for? Little molecules and uh, repeating? If you, if you play the next slide, I can explain yep. in the next slide how that works. So Coming molecules um, are objects that chemists make, but they basically take atoms and they, and they connect them together with bonds, which are basically strong linkages between the atoms. And what you have to do is ask yourself, how complex does the molecule, how many atoms do the molecule have to have before when you find that molecule that you can be sure that molecule was made by a biological process? So this molecule here is the molecule Taxol. It's made um, by a tree bark and it's very complex. It has about uh, um, 70 heavy atoms in it, 62 actually, sorry. And that molecule happens to be a very good drug for cancer in human beings because mm. it stops the growth of, of blood vessels to the tumor. Yes. It's a random accident, but it's produced by a biological system. Now, there are 70 atoms connected in a very special way in that molecule. There are more, way, there are more atoms in the universe uh, well, there are, sorry, there are more possible configurations of that molecule than there are atoms in the universe. So what am I saying? That, that that molecule is, if you were to find that molecule, say on Mars, in any abundance, like two or three copies or 10,000 copies, what would you conclude? Was that molecule made by a random process or by a selected process? And probabilistically, I would argue that that molecule is just so unique, it's like a Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. And because you found 10,000 of them, you would be sure that that molecule was made in a cell or by some kind of biological entity. And mm -hmm. what we can do is probably is convince NASA and a few other space agencies to go around our solar system and not look for little green men and women, but look for complex molecules that we can find in abundance that don't look like a messy tar. And that's the, that's the hypothesis that we're working on in the lab at the moment. One of the things that your, one of the targets that your lab has set itself is to identify all of the molecules within 20 years. I didn't realize there was a finite number. So no, so it's not to identify all the molecules. It was to basically start by um, coming up with a series of um, technologies that can allow us to um, screen the molecules made by a certain type of biological process in a finite amount of time, and then use a computational technique to kind of say, well, this universe of molecules is possible, but not accessible by biology. And what you should do is you view it a bit like um, a like a frozen accident. So what I mean is on, on Earth right now, we have particular types of technology that build on one another. And you've got a lineage of technologies all the way back to the first. Although we could probably make different types of aeroplanes, right, with, you know, 20 wings rather than two, we went down the two wing thin, you know, tail. And so the space of possibilities is actually lowered but the more sophisticated we get. So what I'm saying is once you specialize maybe in a particular language, so like in English, although there's a, you, you remove all the other languages if you, if you don't learn them, you can write more and more sophisticated essays in English over time. It's a very poor way of explaining it. So what we're trying to say is that by narrowing down that space, we can identify most of, say 95% of all the complex molecules in a certain size range. So certainly not all of them, because it's just super infinite. In fact, well, yes. the word yes. super infinite doesn't mean anything, it's just infinite. But within yes. certain boundary conditions, it becomes tractable, countable, knowable. Mm. Yes. It's the concepts that that are just so mind blowing. Yeah, well the molecular space is big, right? It's bigger than space. Yes. And that's why you say if you look up at the stars, you go, whoa, that's big. A chemist in the laboratory has a bigger space to play with than the yeah. uh, astronomer or the cosmologist does. And that's really uh, kind of a hard thing to imagine. Well, the cosmology is hard enough without going into the super bigger wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean. 
So Perry Mason, evo2.org, has come up with this prize, hasn't he? And you're pitching for it. Would you like to tell us about that? Yes, so Perry, what uh, uh, Marshall wants to, I think it's Marshall, um, has come up with this prize, Evolution 2.0, which is basically, you know, someone who can make an evolving system that does something with genetic material. There's a $10 million prize. Although I, although I like Perry and I admire his enthusiasm, the prize does have some catches. Let's put it this way. So that if I was to pitch for the prize, um, I would have to give all the IP, the intellectual property I generate, to the people who give me the prize. So it doesn't really sound like a prize to me. It sounds like an investment. Yes. Now, I, currently, I've made a drug discovery engine that uses evolutionary principles to search chemical space. And I want to search for drugs that are going to attack very important problems such as Alzheimer's and dementia because big pharmaceutical industry is not investing in them properly. And so I think that if I, if I manage to do that, I don't really want to enter that for a prize um, no. in that way. I want to make it more accessible to humanity. So, yes. yeah, I, so, but I, so on the one side, I'm torn because I think that the pri I want to win a prize. Who doesn't yes. want to win a prize? Yes. But the, the devil is in the detail. So Perry's yes. kind of prize is, is, um, is complicated. If I could find a way to win it and the IP is not really worth anything, then sure, I'll mm. go with the prize. Brilliant. Yes. Um, and, I, and I think that he's, you know, taking him at his word, he really wants to stimulate um, mm. argument and um, a what new way of finding out how evolution works in the universe. Mm. And I'm not sure whether he is confident that it won't be discovered because Perry, I mean, Perry's religious. He does believe in God, but yes. he's not a creationist or not anymore. He does mm. think there are naturalistic explanations, but I'm not sure how far he is on the spectrum of yes. where his falsifiability beliefs. And I don't, I didn't want to, you know, push too hard when I was discussing it with him, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I think if it forwards the science and it also helps people um, culturally yes. reconcile the differences between faith-based observations and science-based, well, faith-based beliefs mm. and, and science-based observations and their yes. hypotheses, and why not? It's brilliant for the world. Mm. It has to be ethical, though. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, well, ethics is obviously... It, I, I don't know, I don't, I'll let you finish to say what you're meaning in terms of ethical, but I w definitely would say that ethics is a very interesting concept because it's produced by evolution as well, right? Human beings yes. and, and, and living things display ethic, uh, well, humans certainly display ethical behavior, mm. and that is selective, right? But ethical behavior helps us, helps our society behave better, depend on one another in the future, make sure that we are yeah. not holding the farmer so we have you know we have food and our banks don't fall over and you only need one or two parasites donald trump um yeah. a few others yeah. and suddenly yeah. that they don't have an ethical behavior and they challenge the system somewhat <laughs> mm, for their own benefit you might be interested in a couple of shows i did about a month ago with play whitby the ethical philosopher ethics is his specialism but um uh, the Perry Mason, no, Mason, Perry Marshall's prize sounds as though it's likely, the, the idea behind it is not altruism, but commerce. Yeah, I think there is, a, I think he wanted to be altruistic, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, but he couldn't raise the money without having some backers who uh, thought they were going to get something out of it. So I, yeah, yeah. I, think, it's a, I think, look, taking from his point of view, I'm guessing it's a very American yes. capital base, but but I would, you know, I think I would give him the benefit of the doubt because he's gone out there, he's put in his own mm. reputation on the line, he's mm. got some funders who have the money, and he's got some scientists who are willing to kind of help judge it. And I think, mm. you know, why not? If it allows mm. some young group scientists to get together and develop a new technology that wouldn't be produced any other way, and they win the prize, the universe wins, humanity wins. And yeah, it's, it's, it wins as well, right? Yeah, it's a good initiative. We can't deny that. So I'm going to play your next slide, I think. I say slide, it's movie. So that would be this one.
So this here is a, my first kind of go at making an evolution machine, right, without biology, like generating salad dressing, if you like, droplets and putting them into an arena, a bit like Westworld, but not as kind of um, um, hot and sexy, where we would just basically have droplets working together and um, selecting on one another, maybe causing each other to live or die. And we would make an arbitrary decision about what droplets would be determined to be the fittest um, in that way. And I'm not sure if the other movies are playing in sequence here, but the idea would be that the, the information that we get from the good droplets would be used in future generations. So if you can see in the top right corner here, the robot mixes up the salad dressing. And in the bottom here, you, in this dish, you can see the droplets moving around and interacting. And over some time, we would decide whether those droplets have achieved a fitness or not. And you can see these are very, very simple looking, well, they look very complex, but there's only four oils in it. It's like a salad dressing. And what we were able to show is that very simple oil mixtures with no DNA, no proteins, no metabolism formally could ex um, display incredibly complex behavior and they could cooperate with each other. They can interact with each other and help each other survive in a complex environment. And this is probably how life got started. That life got started at the cellular level with no, it was just bots basically interacting in networks. And over time, they invented the molecular machinery to be more autonomous. Now, what I mean by that, it's a bit like um, how our society develops right now, that as we specialize more, we're able to do more. So if you like now, like um, you in the in the in the early times, a village would have to have you know its winter cheese maker, police you know policeman um, would emerge farm. Now we depend on you know um, uh, global logistics, um, very sophisticated people in some part of the world making a silicon chip, mm -hmm. uh, maybe other people in another part of the world making a special type of light bulb. Or you know, and all those things come together, and that's that's rather analogous to how the cell is now. The cell is so specialized mm. um, that the, the 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 molecules in that cell cannot do anything else. Whereas yeah. you, know, you and I, three hundred years ago, would have to be a right you know writer, farmer, physician, whatnot. Mm. It's a very poor way of explaining it, but as evolution occurs and selection, we allow specialization. Specialization yeah. allows us to do amazing things, you know, yes. launch rockets that can land back on a launch pad or, or, yes. or you know, cure a disease and things like that. Or internet connected computers. Yeah. Yeah. I love the way that you're doing this as a bottom up exercise rather than the theist's view of sort of top down, which means they come to a gap which they can't bridge, and that's where they slot in their God. Yeah, I think that's the, you know, for me, I'm, I'm looking for the exciting moment of discovery, right? Like when, when I can take a dead system and literally go from sand to cells in my robot and then go at that point, like, okay, well, what happened there? And how long does it take for that to happen? And I'm guessing the exciting moment well, won't happen at one point in the lab. It will be maybe over tens of years of experiments. I'll look back and go, oh, that was the process by which we made the first artificial life form. And I think that that's a very important thing to understand that they recognize there is a gap. I think one of the problems that a lot of science have, origin of life science has, is they have not really challenged the theists in the gap. And quite, mm. if I was coming from a theological point of view, I'd say, okay, well, where, where, please explain the complexity of my brain. You know, where did it come from? And, and I think a lot of people have ducked and dived that because although physics can understand simple systems, biology accepts complex systems. Chemistry, I'm sure we've all failed chemistry, right? You know, chemistry is one of those things at school that you kind of all, everyone kind of, I embraced it because I just found it so confusing. But Me chemistry too. is that messy middle bit. And, and that is why it's so exciting. Because I think if we do the right experiments and we just wait for long enough and, we're and, we, and we just ask the question, what happens to make a chemical system develop a memory? That will answer three important things. Like, I'll say the question again. How does chemistry get a memory? We do that. We, we solve origin of life. We solve aliens. 
we work out why we build a consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, a pretty, pretty, pretty interesting payoff for just one hypothesis. Yeah, so one size fits all solution. Amazing. What it, again, it's all different manifestations of this bottom up. The same, the same thing, yeah. The origin of life is the easiest of the hard problems. The next one is basically um, uh, from that is kind of, you know, uh, complex life. Okay. Um, um, intelligence, consciousness, if you see what I mean. Yep. So yes. you've got life, complex life, intelligence, and consciousness. Now, I'm pretty sure that all of life displays those things. You know, even the trees in your garden are conscious, not on the level of watching reality TV or, take, or listening to this or watching this, but they have some degree of interaction in the environment, and maybe they have some way of imagining the future and remembering the past, not as explicitly as we have in our brains, but something like that. But human beings are an extreme example of abstracting machines. Human beings are wonderful because we have, you know, that ability to imagine the future that hasn't been created yet and then go and do it. And I think we're the only animal that can do that. And that's why human beings have a special status, not because we're supernatural, but we are able to have this imagined future. That's why it's ethical to probably kill a cow to eat it, as long as you don't make it suffer in the moment where it's probably not very ethical to kill a human being because of all that potential that you've lost. Mm. Uh, and that's a very interesting philosophical argument lots of people use. And it's way above my pay grade as a chemist, but I'm beginning to grasp some of the concepts there. Yes, yes, we're covering some ground, aren't we? You're sounding a bit like Prince Charles now, talking to the trees. <laughs> no, I didn't say I talked to the trees. No, no, uh, that's no. Very cool. So um, uh, me and Prince Charles, we, we won't talk. What I'm saying, is that I think that on some degree, all, all of matter has some consciousness, but we have to be very, very precise what we mean by that. So yes. you won't deny that trees sense the world. They go and look for water, no. food, yeah. sunlight, right? And they have, they have seasons too. Exactly, and they distribute information. The leaves come out and go away and things track. Mm. So I think that that's what we've got to try to um, really remember. I'm not saying conscious as in, you know, no, we can have a conversation not, with them. We never not, can. Not thought, but awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Con mm. you know, I, I mean, you can have consciousness without thought. I mean, I, I'm one of these people that I don't think in words. I think in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in movies, actually, in mathematical movies, uh, which it takes a lot of people by surprise. I find it very difficult to talk uh, or think in my head ahead of time. It's all I have to translate from movie to to words. <laughs> How interesting. Have you seen a psychologist? No. <laughs> no. Therapist, but never a psychologist. Maybe, maybe I'll get you together with one on here sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'd be an interesting subject for study. Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so here's a, another question. Oh, not that one. Sorry, this one. No, I'm pressing all the wrong buttons here. Do you have a good definition for life? Yes. Yeah, so I don't so I don't have a good definition for life, but I have a good way of distinguishing the products of living processes. So I think that life as a thing does not exist on isolation. And I would like to say, so I think there's a very nice question that you just put up there. So I would say that I am connected to all life on Earth, back to the universal common ancestor, the last universal common ancestor, Luca, that cell that kind of gave all the other cells. So there is a causal chain. So my DNA in my, every cell in my body can be traced back to that cell. Mm. And so what I would say is that everything that's a product of that machine going forward is a product of that living system. So, so let me give you a way of distinguishing life from non-life, which I think yep. is as close as we're going to get, because we're okay. undergoing a revolution in the field, or I'm trying to start revolution, um, a paradigm shift of what life actually is, along with a few other people. And so living systems uniquely hypothesis. My hypothesis is that you, living systems are uniquely able to produce objects 
that are highly complex that cannot form randomly. I'll give you an extreme version, an iPhone. So an iPhone, you know, this is my iPhone here, it's got a bunch of messages on it just now. Um, and that iPhone could not randomly form in some sand. It took a human being to make it, okay? And that human being was made by evolution, and there's that chain. Let's take that molecule Taxol. So that mm. molecule Taxol is evidence of a living process. Let's take a virus. So when the virus is as alive, well, this phone and vi the virus as a complex artifact are evidence of life processes. Viruses are a bit more than the phone because they can reproduce themselves. And so the, the living, so there's, so I think that all I've got to at the moment in my paradigm is I think I can tell you things associated with living um, processes from things that are not. And then we're going to have to have graduations in terms of the amount of boundary condition or autonomy. So, and I, and I know that that sound, may sound like a hand waving question, but I would say that right now it is not possible to um, define life yet because we only have one example. It's a bit like defining flight before yep. the invention of a hot air balloon or an aeroplane. Before those, you looked at birds, insects, uh, maybe flying squirrels or gliding squirrels, and you say, oh, there's this thing called flight. It seems to be flap your wings and you can go up in the air, but I don't know what it means. And then, okay, make an object that goes lighter than this, that can rise in the air, changing the density as a balloon. And also to make an airplane where you have forward motion or a helicopter, you can displace and create lift and therefore fly. So now, now we have all those objects. We can say, what's common to all those objects? Well, they are able to create lift and move from the surface of the earth in the air to another place under their own prop propulsion, okay? And so that, I would say, is kind of where we're getting at with the definition of flight. Now take the definition of life, and you're like, well, it has to have DNA. Does it? Does everything in the universe have DNA? Definitely no, and there is other life in the universe. Does all life in the universe use something like DNA? Doubt it, but let's say that let's say, let's, we don't know. We only have one example. So I think at the moment, all I can be really sure about is if I find um, a complex object and I can find enough of it so it didn't randomly appear, like an artist, you know, like a, a, just a kind of like a, a, uh, a face on Mars, which is just me seeing a face on Mars, then that's going to be my working operational way of recognizing evidence of a living process and i apologize for being really legalistic but i like to be precise about it because what i'm saying is not terribly highfalutin it's really concrete and, and, and i want to keep it that concrete as i try to almost on my own but with a few people around the world try and shift that paradigm mm. well more power to your elbow let's see what else we've got uh, the when you brought up Taxol, it reminded me that uh, I think it was 23 years ago, my first wife who had ovarian cancer and Taxol was just about coming out as a treatment. And uh, they, they didn't offer it to her because they didn't have enough for her to have a course of it, mm -hmm. which was very sad. I hope it's uh, more available now. So one of the big things that has happened since Taxol has been isolated is that people have been making Taxol in the laboratory, and it was mm. a massive effort. You know, there are 200 individual steps would have to be made by a chemist in a lab mm. to do that. Yeah. But now these skeletons are actually much easier to produce. So, yeah, yeah. There, are, there are lots of um, uh, uh, um, uh, drugs out there based upon mm. Taxol. Well, not lots, some. And yeah. um, and they, I mean, it, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's 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 doing okay, I think. Good, good. So, see, what you're talking about is a progression. It's, it's emergence theory. I've got an echo. Can you hear an echo on my voice? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you just fine. No echo here. Good, good, good. And this is what the people I argue with, the believers, have difficulty with. They don't want to see things in terms of a gradual progression from very simple 
slightly more complex, more and more complex, and eventually quite sophisticated, they want, they're dividers. It's like there's two sorts of taxonomists. There are those who look at the differences between species and split them and put them in different genera. And then there are those who look at the similarities between different species and clump them together. There's the splitters and the clumpers. And this is what we're up against. Surely there's got to be some way of making people understand emergence theory. Well, I mean, I don't know. So emergence theory for me as well, is, for a lot of people, is fairly airy fairy what we mean by it. And I think the problem is I don't think the same thing about complexity. A complexity is too is really too vague. And so I'm starting to develop a new theory that doesn't talk about emergence or complexity. It just talks about um, the emergence of information in assembly. And it's really the opposite to a thing that a lot of physicists and chemists and some information theorists use, which is entropy. And entropy is merely a measure of disorder. So mm -hmm. everyone uses entropy to, to, to look at transitions in physical systems. Mm -hmm. But the problem is what you're measuring is a transition in disorder. So you're, you're basically measuring what you didn't know and what you've lost. What I've tried to do is turn it on its head and try and develop a theory of assembly when I can see the evidence of accreted information over time being used to basically take, to produce objects which are now more complex. But let's re replace the word complex to more assembled. Okay. And so when I say, oh, is that more assembled than that? Then you can say, well, how many individual features are there? You know, we often say to people, who is more complex, you know, person A or person B? And, you, you know, and the, and the complexity is a, is a function of their psychologist they've talked to. But if you take a, 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 a uh, say, a, a computer program or a state in a game, a chess game or a game of Go, you can calculate how assembled that is by the number of moves that you have left and the number uh -huh. of moves you've made. Right. And I think that, that is a more productive way because I can see that emergence theory is good, but it's vague, right? It's kind of like right. it's difficult to capture. And that's the problem with complexity. It's difficult to capture. Ah. So the theory that I'm playing with is it like a like an entropy quantifiable, and um, but we will aim to one day replace entropy with degree of assembly. This is that's, this is that's very heretical, unpublished, yeah. un unverified. <laughs> It could be Cronin just talking nonsense again, but it's a hypothesis I think is worth exploring. Yes, yes. I was going to call you a her heretical, is there a word? A, a heretic. Heretic. Yeah, that's the word, heretic, thank you. I was groping for that. So what is information then? Is it, was it produced by this assembly that could replicate? Uh, was there a time when there was no information? And it, is it growing as, you know, we make more molecules that can repeat themselves? I, I think so. And this is something that, that, that really perversely is going to get me into cosmology, into physics at some point, because the physicists say, look, the origin of the universe required a very ordered state. That is a state of lots of information and certainty. And when the universe got going, it becoming disorder, and that disorder could be used to power the creation of some order. But I think yes. that's actually kind of wrong. Because I think I think to be a to be a this is kind of really, you know, I would like to challenge Lawrence Krauss on this and other people, or maybe Sean Carroll, who's a, I can I can fix that. I can get you and Lawrence together. I'm not sure I mean I know Lawrence runs really well. I'm not sure I want to talk to Lawrence for various reasons, but anyway. I would say that, okay. um, I would say that the the physicists require there to be a god at the origin of the universe to create all this order because yes. no one knows where it came from. You can't. No. There's no competent physicist alive today, and that troubles me now. And I was like, well, oh my gosh, I'm a na I'm a naturalist. I'm not a dualist. I'm you know, I believe in nothing right so it's almost a belief right i believe that there is nothing i can determine it all but then when i realized that assembly theory creates information i realized that the origin of the universe didn't need 
they, 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 they didn't need low entropy at the origin of the universe. And what it needs is a readjustment to the way we look at time. But I'm not ready to go there yet. But the answer lies with time and assembly. But let's answer your question. Is information created? Yes. What I, I mean, let's, and that's before the information theorists go crazy and say, no, oh, there's information everywhere. No. Information only exists in universes which are alive. In universes Whoa. that are dead, there is no information because there's no encoding and no decoding process. And folks, in fact, I, I told you, I told you, folks, he's an original thinker. <laughs> And, it, and that, that argument about information requires the physicist to be the god, looking down on the universe, counting yeah. particles. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas what happens is information gets created randomly. Well, information get is a time-traveling thing. What do I mean? Whoa, whoa. You have random mess, random mess, random mess in your rocks. Then there is one chance configuration that is randomly generated, that has no value to the universe. But then just by chance that that organized structure has a better chance of surviving the wind and the rain than another one, and then it finds a way to copy itself, and that motif gets put back in them to template other ones. So it's a bit like a, a, now you have a cycle of where the rock is like not as boring as before, and then the rocks start competing. And then suddenly it's a then mutation and random selection on the rocks go on, and then the assemblyness goes up. And before you know it, you've invented the cell, uh, complex life, mammals, the political system, and Donald Trump. And and you have our rich complexity and contradictions in just one foul swoop. So what I mean is that we appear to be creating information with selection. And I still don't understand exactly what that means. Um, uh, and it's one of the big mysteries that I'm kind of trying to trace down with a few uh, physicists around the world um, in the US um, and, in, and in Japan and, uh, you know, and, and in the UK. You realize that you could commercialize this and make a fortune in the same way that Sean Carroll has. As he, all he does is stand up there and speculate about what we don't know. <laughs> what do you mean by his books? I mean... Yeah, I, I think Sean is a brilliant writer, and he's a very precise thinker. And I th and also, um, I, I think that he kind of dismisses things. So Sean and I used to argue quite a lot about time and stuff and, you know, complexity, and he'd say, no, it's all the core model, it's all this. But now Sean, as he's, I've watched him the last couple of years, is like more open to complexity and thermodynamics. So, oh, right. you know, an emergence. But I think yes. Sean needs to be as precise with those terms as he is precise with quantum mechanics. And then I think he will then come round to my way of thinking. Wow. My brain is hurting. <laughs> well, I hope it's been entertaining. <laughs> it's been fantastic. It's been fan bloody tastic, in fact. So I'm going to just uh, thank you in a minute, but I'm going to prepare people for next week because. Um, Currently, I've, I've challenged a self-proclaimed real deal Christian apologist by the name of David Salako, who uh, I run into quite a lot on the internet, to debate me on the motion, this house believes there is a God. He hasn't accepted yet, but um, I would like my audience to tell me, what should I do? Should I empty chair him and go ahead without him there or should I find somebody else to come and guess for us next week tell me in the comments and of course the once this broadcast is ended it becomes a podcast immediately and if you have the time you will be able to see the comments and maybe engage with them yeah. and of course when it's a podcast, it's available to you to distribute wherever you like, maybe use for teaching material, who knows what. But thank you very much. It's, you know, it's truly fantastic to have had you as a guest on this show. Well, very nice to talk to you. And hopefully the people that have been listening and watching, have, you know, um, has made them think a bit. I don't know the answers. I only know the questions. <laughs> well, there'll be more see it. 
as the days go by. And meanwhile, meanwhile, go and get yourself a beer. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. See you later.